They want to have an extension for an Apple adapter, perhaps. Okay. I want to copy that. Oh, yeah. uh, it's probably old. It's four years old. I think they'll work with that. Some of us have those 12 hour batteries that were just released. Alright. Apologize for the skew. Um, later on, when we do some double browsers, we're going to need that space, and unfortunately, our projector does not support that. Alright, so anyway, I'm Jonathan Martin. I'm going to be talking about Batman JS today. It's a front end JS MVC framework for the front end. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. So Batman JS uh, started in about 2011, so it's not a terribly new framework. It's had quite a bit of contribution activity on it. Uh, it uh, was initially started by the guys at Shopify, so uh, they've got a pretty cool track record. They've got some new stuff, and they were using it in their new beta application. So it's pretty cool. I haven't seen much of it in production yet. It's kind of on its way. Uh, the guys at TCO, you guys have seen their website. They're starting to try to implement that into their back end as well. And uh, one of the core members, uh, Zach Hubert, puts out a lot of really good uh, stuff on Batman.js, so I still need to this content. So 050 uh, released August 2011, uh, first public release. Uh, started by Nick Small, the lead JS developer. That kind of equals only JS developer, last I checked. He works with a bunch of Ruby developers. Um, and I'm not going to say anything about the name. It has something to do with an Arduino. I have yet to find an explanation for why it's called Batman. But uh, so Nick Small works on a team with a ton of Ruby developers. So they all do Rails, of course. He's the only JS guy. So he had to come up with some kind of framework that the Rails guys would love. So he uh, took the elevator pitch that Rails has, the values, for instance, convention or configuration, uh, architecture first, code later. Um, path of least resistance, all these principles. Uh, it also tries to make the code look very similar to Rails. About the only change you'll see is camelization and the at symbol as opposed to self dot. So it's very, very similar. And it tries to have that initial appeal factor that you get with Rails with low boilerplate. So there's a few key concepts we'll need to touch on just before we dive into the demo. So the first one is key paths. Key paths are dot separated strings that you can observe. Um, and this is very similar to any language that supports dot syntax, except that you can actually subscribe to events for whenever anything changes. So uh, this implements the key observable mix-in, and this is at the very root of Batman, the ability to observe whenever anything changes. Kind of like jQuery, which is all event-based. Um, so properties are kind of the end of a key path. They're the very last part of it, and it's an actual object that you can observe for changes or um, bind to events fired on. And then, of course, I keep throwing around this word bindings. Bindings means to uh, take the value that's in, say, the JavaScript client or Batman, and then put it over in a view uh, in the template. So that's one-way binding. Later, we'll be working on two-way bindings. So here's an example. Um, we have a Batman object, which Batman provides us. And it's called object, but don't be fooled. It's got tons of functionality. Out of the box, it has all this observability. You can watch all these events. So, for instance, kind of like Ruby, we can create two accessors here. So it's my first name and my last name. These are just identity functions. But we can also make these computed properties. And this is where Batman starts to shine. Uh, so we, here we have a full name accessor, which is a combination of my first name and my last name. And the cool thing is if we use this at get notation, instead of just directly accessing it like we would in JavaScript, then Batman automatically knows when to upset, update full name if anything changes. It automatically propagates that. Um, so, for example, we have an observation of full name, and um, we can observe what the change was, and it only gets called when first name or last name changes. So it's pretty cool if we stick with that. And then we can just handle standard events with the at on, so we can listen to this hash named event and call something. So kind of a whirlwind tour, but there's a lot to it, and it's good stuff, though. The next key concept is data sources. We are on the JavaScript side. We're in the browser, so <coughs> no data is ever really saved. Um, However, Batman provides some nice storage adapters so we can save all this stuff. We have local session storage. And we also have a RESTful interface storage adapter. And then there's also a Rails storage adapter, uh, which is pretty awesome. And all of these uh, operate pretty seamlessly with the models. You can just swap out these adapters. You can even do fallbacks if you want to. 
all of these adapters return some kind of set. So if you ask a post, for instance, for all of the records it has, all of these adapters will return a Batman set, which is observable. You can see whenever an item is added or taken out or changed. Um, but this is also very similar to Node.js. If you guys have played with Node.js, it's all asynchronous, just like JavaScript traditionally has been. But you usually get some immediate return value from anything you call. I'll be calling these IOU objects, um, just for the way they sound. It literally means you'll get a temporary object that you really don't want to use, but it's just there. And it's just a guarantee that more is coming later on. So here's an example. I have a model, a Batman model in the post. <coughs> and I'm telling it to persist with the Batman rail storage, you can literally swap out any storage adapter you want in there. It's really easy to do. And then I just have to tell it what attributes that model is expecting. Say it's a JSON backend. We know what keys to expect in the JSON object. And then we can even define some that have their own encoders. Like if it's a rail state, we want to probably convert that JSON string into just a standard rail state. So then an example of IOU. Say I have this controller down here. Here at the bottom, have an index action. We see down here uh, at awesome.post.load, we give it a copy, we just give it a callback function uh, with the Node.js style error, uh, comma results. But the immediate return value is just temporary. You don't usually want to bind to it. Um, and we'll see where this comes into play later. And then the last part is differentiating between these three terms. Templates in a Batman are just what they sound like. They're kind of like handlebars if you guys have used Ember.js. Uh, they impose some kind of structure, but they have very little logic in them. Uh, views are not at all like Rails. The views are actually wrappers around those templates that try to handle some of that logic. And then controllers are very similar to Rails. Any action that a user can initiate um, is typically routed through that. So without further ado, let's go into a tour. So this is the, you guys can't really read the text, but. Um, so this is the Batman homepage, if you guys want to go check it out. Today, I'm going to be starting with this. This is um, some kind of put up on my GitHub page. If you go to nibbler slash awesome dash starter, this is the starter Rails app I'll be working from today. It's very standard. I haven't really done any magic in it, just some basic scaffolding. So if you guys want to follow along, you're welcome to do that. And then I'll also be using Robin. This is a plugin I've written to do real-time sync between a server side and the client side. And I'll explain exactly what that means later on. So let's go ahead and get started. Alright, so first of all, let me show you what we've got so far. Alright, so first let me show you the main layout we've got. Very simple, very standard. Um, we just have some standard includes up here. And down here we have our yield that we typically have in Ruby. There's one interesting thing here. We have this data attribute. And in Batman, all the templates, instead of having handlebars where you've got curly brackets to define structure, you tell Batman what the structure is with these data attributes. So uh, you'll often see a lot of extra divs here and there because you're um, putting structure on the content. So in this case, we've got this magical yield main. That just gets us started, as we'll see later on. We've got a few tools in the gem file, not much. I'm using Haml just because typing out all these data attributes later on becomes an utter pain. So Haml rocks in that regard. Quiet assets, you guys have probably used that, but this way we can just see the JSON requests and we won't see the requests for the JavaScript. And we've got just some JavaScript libraries. And down here, these three are pretty important. So uh, you guys probably may know that Rails 3, we used to have these wonderful active record observers. They got dropped in Rails 4 for good reason. Uh, there are better ways of doing it, but just for speed, we're going to be cheating and using those. And then we have Thay. This is how we're going to handle our web sockets later on when we get into real time. So this should be cool. So I've got two models um, already scaffolded out, post and blog, excuse me, post and comment, very standard. I'm going to go ahead and rate db, the, rate db migrate so that way we can get the database set up and start that and show you what we got so far. All right, so very standard. Right now we don't have any posts. This is a, your standard resourceful controller. And we've got our standard show page. We've got our edit actions. And just for our sakes, 
I'm going to add a second one so I can show something off later. All right, so that's all pretty boring. It's just your standard Rails controller. You know, this is what you saw when you watched Rails casts. Um, so we also have the comments model, which we've got lenient routing. You can do it without the post dash two, um, but that's just uh, we're going to be doing it very strictly. But it's lenient. So let's get started with good stuff. <coughs> so now we're going to start writing the Batman app. We want to make this all happen on the browser side because what you guys saw, saw it was really slow. I'm running in, in development here. And each of those requests was taking about four or five seconds, or at least it feels like that up to me. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, if you guys uh, happen to have the repository open, I've already created this nice little directory structure for Batman. The important file here is this app.js.copy that I'm including. In here, we're going to define our actual Batman class, uh, our main app. So let's call it Awesome, just because I can. This is a Batman app. So we have to define a couple things in here. We can set the window title in here. Uh, and you can change this anywhere. And next, we want to be defining, um, we want to tell Batman where to find all those templates. By default, it's assets slash Batman slash HTML. I don't like the name HTML, so I'm just a little bit picky. So tell it the path to the HTML assets, and it changes every version too. Tell it that's under Batman templates. Could you move the font just a little bit? Sure. Unfortunately, our uh, displays are quite behind with that. We'll clean up the latest delete. All right, so I'm going to add in a little bit of magic here. This is uh, one of my little pet peeves about Batman is you'll see a lot of DOM flickers. Um, so this tries to address that. Uh, next, we define our routes in here. So this is a little bit unlike Rails, because normally you have a separate file. Well, in Batman, our app files are actually so short, we go ahead and define our routes in here. So this is very similar to Rails. Resources, routes, and we'll do a root posts. Now we get into some actual Batman stuff. We want to observe the run event, and we'll be calling this later. Our run event just means we've just told the app to start running. Nothing's really set up. So I'm just going to print to console just so we know what's going on. Here is where you would do things like uh, initialize socket connections, um, do X XHR requests. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do here is anything DOM related. And the reason is because the DOM has probably not been loaded at this point. If you want to do anything DOM related, then you want to listen to the ready events. And this is where we'll do more interesting stuff. But for now, I'm just going to print to console so we know that it's loaded. But, but down here is also where we can do some DOM events. So let's go ahead and reload this. We're going to open up console. Nothing's happening uh, down here. We should have seen some text printed. And this is because we haven't yet run the app. So I'm going to put that in my application copy file because we're requiring self. I'm going to listen for the onload event from jQuery called awesome.run. Now if I reload, we should get some text printed out. So it says it's running. Um, it says it can't find this method dispatch of undefined. It's trying to load the first controller action we told it to do. We haven't actually written a controller yet, so let's do that. Post controller. Yes. All right. So when we get down to these Batman objects, we always want to name system under our main application. So let's call this post controller. It's namespace under awesome. And it descends from a Batman controller. There's a few things we have to define in here. Uh, first, uh, unlike Ruby, we'll often be minifying our JavaScript. So we need to define what the routing key is as a string, because that will not get obfuscated. So this is something that in development you don't have to worry about, but as soon as you go to production, if you do any kind of minification, which you need to, you're going to run into issues. So like Rails, we can write our actions here, <coughs> route to. It gets a params object, kind of like Rails does as well. And all we're going to do is we're going to tell this mysterious post object to load up all its records. And here we pass it a node style callback. Um, if you guys have played around with node, you know that everything is asynchronous, so you always pass in a function to finish up your dirty work. 
and we're passed in the error as the first argument, and usually results right after that. So once we get the results, we're just going to throw the error if we get it, just so we can debug that in the console. And then we're going to use this at set. And this is kind of like setting an instance variable in a controller uh, in Rails. How if you share that same context, so you can handle all that, but we use at set so we get all these cool bindings and stuff. So I'm going to set posts to awesome.post.get loaded. Now, this is a little bit contorted. I could have used results instead of re getting all the loaded posts, but results isn't going to get updated later when we get into real time, so I'm going to have to leave that one unexplained for a moment. Let's go over here and reload the page. Well, now we got a new error. Cannot find method load, and that's because we haven't even written our model yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's write post model. So again, we're going to make a new class, namespace under awesome. It's going to extend from batman.model spread. And then we need to give it some of these same things uh, to prevent minification issues. So we're going to say the resource name, which is, excuse me, post. And then we need to say what the storage key is. And so this is going to be posts. And this is kind of like Rails, how you would set a table name. All right. Then we need to tell it how to actually persist this data. We're going to use Batman's Rails storage adapter. And then we just need to tell it what attributes to expect when we make these JSON requests. So if I recall correctly, I believe we had title, <coughs> body, tags, published, status, and then published on, which is a date. Let's reload here and see what we get. All right, so we made a little bit of progress. Uh, we have a new error down here. We have a 500 server error. This is because it's trying to render out the index, which is expecting to be rendered in a Rails controller. Well, it isn't. It's being rendered out as an asset. Let's go down here to post index. And I'm going to, and I'm just going to literally strip out all this dynamic code just to get us going. Save that, refresh. All right, cool. Now we got through both error, through both messages. That means everything seems to work, but we're not seeing any posts here. And if you recall, when we first started, we made two. So let's just see if that instance variable was actually set in the controller properly. So I'm going to do a get. I'm going to get the controller instance for posts, and then get the post variable. Well, it's got a set. That's what we expect. But it's only of size zero. It should have two. What's going on? Well, it's doing this because if you look at the main, if you look at the uh, Rails scaffold, when it creates this JSON, if you guys use JBuilder, when it renders this out, you can't scroll sideways, but it only it doesn't have ID anywhere in there. Batman always has to have an ID for doing its uh, map identity. So if you guys use Rails, whenever you create a model, whenever you create a model, there's only one instance or a particular instance of that model object in space per ID. And this makes things a little bit easier. So this is called uh, identity mapping. So in our case, I'm going to hack it a little bit here and get all the attribute names and use all of those. So that will include ID. Now in production, you probably don't want to do this uh, because there are probably lots of attributes that you need to keep private. But this will get us going for now. All right, so now if I regret it, cool. Now it has two items in it. That's what we want. So we are connecting to the JSON backend. It's not showing anything here, though. Well, let's go fix that. So over on our index file, we're going to add some stuff in here. First, I'm going to, like a proper HTML5 guy, I'm going to change this to a t-head. And let's make this a t-body. And then for each post, we want to add a new row. So the way that Batman does this kind of structuring is with a data attribute. So in our case, we're going to use the for each helper and then tell it what the new local variable will be in that context and do it for each post in post. Now again, remember that views, excuse me, templates are rendered in their controller's context, which means we have access to anything we send in the controller, just like Rails. 
So I can do for each post in posts. And then I want to render out these cells. So again, we're doing data. Now we get to use uh, something that's very awesome in Batman and that every framework that claims to do bindings has to do bindings. So we're going to bind, in this case, to the post title. And this post.title, those are the key paths we were talking about. They're in this current context, in this case, the controller context. And then the dots separate it, kind of like you would access uh, properties in most languages. But we get these new bindings. All right? So let's do that. Let's copy paste that. Let's change that to body, tags, publish. Let's spell that right. All right? And while we're here, we did ha have some buttons over on the right, so let's go ahead and add those. So we'll make a new cell, and then we'll do a link. Now, again, we're doing it uh, typically with links. You would just put in a regular link when you pre-rendered it. Not in Batman. Here we have this route helper that we can give it, and we access routes with a keypad. It's kind of like Rails, kind of not. So we call routes, posts, and then we pass it in the current posts, and like Rails, it will automatically generate the proper route for us. And this will be our show button. And then at the end of this, we want to go to show, so we can append this dot edit to tell it what member action we want to do. Let's change that to edit. Destroy is a little bit different. Uh, unlike Rails, and kind of like Rails at the same time, you can't actually route to the destroy action. However, you can call it as an action. So the way we do this is we can subscribe to the event click that Batman gives us, and we'll tell it that we want to wrap to the destroy action. And we'll see just what that means in a moment. All right, so let's refresh and see what we get. Cool, we've got a list. This is all happening, all in Batman. None of this is being pre-rendered or pre-loaded. But none of these buttons will work because we haven't actually rendered those actions. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's first of all go over to the show page. It's got a lot of dynamic code in it, and this is going to cause issues because we're using it as an asset. We're not actually rendering it out. So I'm going to post uh, paste in a basic view. This is all observed foundation if you guys have used that. And we're doing nothing special here. We're just doing data bindings to different attributes on posts. And down here we've got some links. <coughs> nothing too crazy. And while we're here, let's go ahead and write that show action in our post controller. So down here, show is routable, so we'll expect to get this params dictionary. So now we're going to tell this post to do a find. Rails has this exact same functionality. We have to parse the integer value of the params ID, because the JSON object comes in as a string. And then we have to pass it the callback. And I'm using this double gets notation so I can keep the same context because I want to keep using the app, uh, the app property, uh, the self reference, excuse me. Throw an error if one occurred. And then down here, we want to set post to that record. All right, so now I've got that object. Refresh. Cool. Now we've got a show action, and you'll notice nothing reloaded. All it's, it's not even requesting that new object. It's already been loaded, so it's caching it. Let's go back. Let's make destroy work. Destroy is actually really easy, because we don't need anything more than an action. So we're going to write the destroy action, but it takes in a slightly different uh, um, function notation, and this is because it isn't routable. So it expects the DOM node, and it also expects any callbacks, and then context. This particular line is of the utmost importance. Contexts are the basis, or the bread and butter of Batman, so to speak. Um, anytime you're looking for data, you have to <coughs> consider if you're in a rendering context or even a controller context, what context you are completely changes what data you get, and you'll spend any time when you first start, you'll spend lots of time debugging that. So in our case, we want to get that render context and access the posts. So I'm going to call context.getPost and then call destroy on it. Destroy just passes us an error. I'll just throw an error if one occurred. And then we want it to redirect back to the post index. And we're already at the post index when we're doing the destroy action. 
the at redirect actually just causes it to re-render. So it uh, asks, um, so it asks for a re-render of that particular set. So let's refresh. So now if I click destroy, it works. And if I refresh, it's still gone. So we know it's communicating with Rails properly. All right. So next we need to do edit. So edit is a little bit more work. While we're here, let's go ahead and uh, write the actions for it. So we've got edit, which is routable. And this is going to be so similar to the show action. I'm actually just going to copy paste it here. All we're going to do is load up that record. And now let's go work on this form. So this is the form that Rails generated for us when we did scaffold generation uh, for doing that editing. So this is just a straightforward HTML5 form. The only unique thing about it is that we're adding these uh, at the end. We have data, and then we do that binding. Now here's the cool thing. Batman automatically provides us two-way bindings. So whereas before we're just doing a binding from Batman to the view, if you made changes to the DOM, it wouldn't be reflected in Batman. Two-way bindings do reflect from the DOM back to Batman. And this is only built in for inputs and text areas, but later on we'll add our own way to do bindings. All right? Now let's go over into edit. Edit is going to look very similar, but we have to get rid of all this Rails and Ruby code. So let's put in some Batman code. So we've got a form element. We use this form for helper up here, and we change the context to post. On the submit event, we tell it to go to the update action, which we'll go ahead and write. And then we get this other wonderful helper. We tell Batman that we want it to render the post's form partial beneath this DOM element. And then we have a couple of routes. So let's go ahead and write that update action. So update is also writable, similar to Rails. And we could reload the post up here and get a reference to it and then update it, but we don't have to. Update is called in the same context as that view. So we actually have access to that post object. So we're going to call save, and we expect an error callback. I'm going to copy this down here, actually. Throw an error, and then just redirect. Let's give this a try. So now if I go to edit, cool, we get this form loading. I'm not even going to try to spell that. <laughs> Let's not hit save. All right, well, that all works. That actually changed the title, and again, without reloading the page at all. And it's a good bit faster than every time I've had to refresh the page, so this is already a welcome change. Well, we have one last thing to add. We have to actually add functionality for creating a new record. And this is actually ridiculously similar to edit and update. So let's change that. We'll make this new. We'll make this create. Create action is going to be exactly the same as update because we don't have to look up the post again. We can just use the context. And then up here, all we're going to do is create a blank object, kind of like what you would do in Rails. So we'll set post to a new awesome record. Or excuse me, awesome post. And then over in our show action, excuse me, our show page, we want to add a link down here. Excuse me, not show, index. So here at the bottom, let's add a link. With data bind, go to route. We'll go to routes.posts.new new post. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, I click new post. Oops, we didn't actually write that new page. So I'm actually going to take the edit page and post it into new. That's how similar the two are. I'm just going to change the name. And instead of going to update, I'm going to tell it to go to create. Now if we go back to new, we actually get a form. Whoopee. And it created it. So now we've got a full resourceful system all in Batman. That's kind of standard run-of-the-mill. I mean, if you had a really fast rail server, you could do that any time of the day. 
What makes it cooler? Real time. So we're going to do quickly digress into real time. I'm going to try to show you just how fast we can do it, but it's all fast to me. So we're going to add real time. And what I mean by real time is whenever a particular record changes anywhere in the world, um, say it's a post that everybody should be able to see and everybody should be able to edit. Not very smart. But any time changes are made to it and persisted to the server, any open browser should instantly see those updates. Instantly. No matter where you are. So the way we're going to do that is recall that Batman already gives us this binding from the Batman object to the view. So we've got that settled. So we just have to handle the updates from the Rails server to the Batman object. And so we're going to use Robin to do that. Um, but first, let's start in the Rails backend. So to do this, I'm going to use Rails observers. Again, there's better ways to do this, but we're going to listen to any active record events for a record. Um, so let's create an observer. Post real time. That would be. So here, I'm putting in, it's a very standard uh, Rails observer. The only interesting thing I've added up here is some published code. This is straight from Railscast, honestly. And it just posts to an open phase server, which will run as a separate process. But everything else is the same. Uh, after create, it publishes to this phase channel, and it publishes the JSON object with all the post attributes. It does the same for update. And then on destroy, it only publishes the ID, because that's all we need to get rid of an object in the client. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to tell Rails about these observers, because uh, otherwise it won't blow them up. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to cheat. So first we have to tell it to auto-load the real-time directory so those constants will be available. And then we have to tell Active Record about those observers. So now I'm going to quit the server and restart it. And over here, I made a prop file for Fay. So I'm going to call format start, and this will get fay.ru running which is what we're using to do web sockets. So now, if I go over here, refresh, nothing's really changed. Um, the only thing that will change, we'll notice, is when we go over here to edit. Say I just get rid of the period. If I go over here to the console, we'll see that it printed out updating. And if you recall, this is what I put in the observer. I put a put s stating what was going on, just to make sure that observer is being called. So we know things are getting published over WebSockets, but nothing on the client is listening. So let's make it listen. So first thing we need to do is go over to our application layout. And we're going to add a few things. Uh, we're going to tell it, oops. Let's try it first. <coughs> So first, we're going to tell it to load up the JavaScript library that Faye provides us. So we're talking on the 1992 port, and we can load up the JavaScript library. And then the next thing we do is we add this little meta tag, um, just as a nice way to tell the app what socket server it's going to connect up to. So let's go on over to the main app. And we've got to do a few things here. Remember I told you that we'd be initializing sockets here? We want to open up the connection here, because we don't depend on the DOM. So the first thing we do is we're going to publish to the log, just so we can see that. And then we open up a socket. Uh, we use jQuery to get the value of that meta tag. And then we do this thing down here. This is something I'm looking to move out, because I consider it boilerplate. But we're telling Robin that the socket's open for it to use, because uh, Robin lets us handle the socket. I don't really like that. I'm looking to move that out. But anyway, we tell it's ready anyway. And then we need to go over to our actual model and tell it to start using Robin. So again, boilerplate, very quickly, going to change. So we're going to create a new Robin instance, pass in this class. Let's refresh. And to demo this, I'm going to open two browsers. This is why I need that extra width, unfortunately. So let's open a second browser here. Let's click Edit. Let's see what happens when I say well, if you guys were watching fast enough, over here it changed instantly. We didn't have to do anything. This all happens automatically. We can even delete records, and they'll automatically be deleted. We can create records. This is all happening in real time instantly without reloading the page, and if we reload the page, it's all going to be exactly the same. So that's pretty cool. We've uh, gotten pretty far. We've got real time. Uh, your doctor told you to eat more ice cream, et cetera, et cetera. Life is all good. Um, wouldn't it be cool if we turned this into a CMS system? You guys have seen the HTML5 content editable tag. Uh, personally, that's really cool to me. It's cool enough to me 
I'm going to show you how to add in a few steps. So right now, this is our show page. Nothing's editable. It's really boring. It's really boring. So why don't we try adding in some editability? So let's go over to our show page. And let's change that to a text area for now so we get these two lay bindings. And down here, let's add a P tag. We'll do the binding, but we'll also add in content editable, true. And this is something HTML5 gives us. So now if we refresh, we have a text area. And if we start typing, you'll notice it automatically propagates from the text area over to the P tag because we've done this binding. But this is just one way bindings. Only the text areas do two way binding. If we click over here with its content editable, it won't propagate back. So we can't use it? No, we can write our own wrapper. So what we're going to do is we're going to write an editable view. This is where Batman views come in handy. Handling this kind of binding and propagation uh, on our own takes a lot of logic. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to wrap it up in a Batman view. So let's do that. Let's go over to our views directory and create an editable view. Code. All right. That is definitely not copy script. Okay. So here we're creating a Batman view. We're just calling it editable view. We first tell it what view, what options we expect to be passed in as data attributes. In our case, for this editable view to work, we need to know what key path we're observing and getting data from, and we need to know what record to save whenever changes are made. So that way we get these cool real-time propagations. So a view needs two methods to find. The first one is the constructor. Now, the constructor can be called anytime, anywhere. This is used as an optimization step to make sure too many JavaScript objects aren't open at the same time. So typically in the constructor, you want to do nothing other than call super and do some bare basics initialization. Where you really want to do that logic is in the ready event. So, but take care, the ready event can be called even when the view doesn't actually have a DOM, event, excuse me, a DOM node backing it. So in my case, I don't want to handle that. I'm just going to have it not even call ready if we don't have a node. If we do, I'm going to tell it to add content editable to it so we can click around on it. And then I'm going, this is a little bit of uh, Batman magic that you'll just get going through the source. But um, I'm going to grab this key path object. Before, we were just getting the values of key paths. But if we want to actually observe a key path, we have to get Batman's key path object. So here we get that key path. And then we get the property. Recall that at the end of the key path is the property. And properties are what we can actually observe. So once we get that property, we're going to add a caller, excuse me, a callback. We're going to observe it and just fire this event as well. And we're expecting a new value and old value in the function, um, the function <coughs> name. And we're going to get the value of that property, and we're going to get the HTML of this node. Now what we'd like to do is make those two the same. So here we do a little bit of caching. We check to make sure they aren't the same. This is because you can get into infinite event recursions if you don't break the chain, if nothing's happened. So all of that gives us what we used to have, which is one line, bind, colon, post, stop, body. So we really haven't gotten much. What we're more interested in is this second part. We're doing bindings back from the DOM to the Batman object. And so here we get the DOM node, which is a jQuery object, and we attach some events to it. So the one of interest down here is the dot on, blur, key up, key down, case. So here we're listening for any changes to that content editable um, DOM, to that DOM node. And so we make sure that as long as it isn't the same as the cached value, just to prevent infinite loops, we'll go ahead and update the property in Batman world. And we'll change that to be the HTML. And then finally on this last one, when I click out of the um, content editable DOM node, I want it to save the record. So that way we can see this stuff. So let's go use this. Let's go back over to our show page. And I'm going to yank this copy. Paste that out. All right, so again, I'm going to do a data attribute. I'm going to tell Batman that this is an editable view. And then I'm going to pass in those attributes. I'm going to pass in the key path, which is post.body. And then I'm going to pass in the record we want to save when changes are made. Post. Three left. Alright, so now if I make changes, notice that
that now we've got the two-way bindings. It's going back from an editable event all the way back to the text area. And if I click outside, it updates in real time over to the other window. So there we've got a full, you know, a pretty lame CMS system. We don't even have a toolbar to change formatting. We can add that. So let's add it. So I'm only going to add about three lines of code if I can find the file to add it in. Let's go over here to editable view. So down here where we had this lovely chain of jQuery callbacks, I'm going to add in the hello plugin. If you guys have seen hello.js, it works off of the editable format and just adds a nice little toolbar using Twitter Bootstrap and some uh, jQuery UI magic. So now, if I double click, we get this awesome little bar down here. I make those changes. Cool, it bolts it, but it doesn't update everything instantly. Because we have one more event to listen to. So after paste, I'm going to listen to this event that it fires, the hello modified event. And this is just something you'll find in the docs if you want to listen for changes. So now let's give this a try. So now if I change that, it propagates instantly in Batman. If I click outside, it propagates everywhere. So now we've got a full real-time system all happening instantly, and we've got even an awesome formatting bar in, you know, that one. Five minutes, somewhere around in there. So we've got all that. Um, I had it more planned, but we don't have quite time for it. It's really easy to add the comments in as an associated record. So I'm just going to show you guys the end result as quickly as possible. So I'm going to start up end result. So let me open up another page here. It automatically propagated everywhere. So now we've got comments, and those are associated records. So this is kind of a filter of sorts, where you can filter down those comments. Batman handles all of that in the back end for doing that kind of associated stuff. All right, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour. Let's do a quick overview. So we started with a Rails JSON back end. And all we had it doing was listening with active record observers. We had it listening and propagating these events. And then we had it serving up all these Batman assets for us. And we used Batman to handle all this uh, live binding. Um, so we did that with an adapter to the Rails storage. And again, you can swap these out. That's your data source. And then we took advantage of the few bindings to do all this stuff without having to do it all ourselves. And then finally, we added real time over WebSockets with Bay. It's the implement the Bay protocol, so you can publish the channels. And then we used Robin.js to help uh, remap identities on the uh, client side and listen for these events. So, Batman, as we can see, has a few advantages going for it. The first is the entire framework is written in CopyScript. Now, I've played with Ember.js, it's awesome. Uh, I really don't like that it's written in JavaScript. You can write, of course you can write CopyScript for any JavaScript equivalent, it's pre-compiled. But uh, having a framework that's written with CopyScript means you'll see a lot of the same CopyScript idioms. So if you go look through the Batman um, docs and you go look through the source, that's something you can use in your CopyScript and it's going to be idiomatic, it's going to be clean, it's going to look a lot like Rails. We've got two-way bindings, not fr many frameworks support the two-way. And then the architecture, if you guys just go look through the source, is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the observable. For instance, we had a Batman object. It handles observations and events at the lowest level that you can imagine. And doing it that low level keeps the entire framework very consistent. So you can look through the source and see the same patterns. And you won't find yourself repeating yourself often on the same code. For instance, uh, ember.js, if you write a computed property, at the end it makes you state what those values are that it depends on. So it can listen for events. Batman doesn't make you do that. It automatically determines what your sources are. And finally, it's low boilerplate, but take that with a grain of salt. It's too much boilerplate for me personally. Um, I found uh, that I was writing lots of hacks here and there. And there's a lot of subtleties in the context. Uh, you guys, uh, I get lost too, just talking about all the context we're changing out of. Controllers, the views, the render context. They're all over the place. And so you'll spend a lot of time in the console as you first learn this, trying to figure out all of that. Rails integration could use a little work. Uh, you saw that we were using publish underscore on. 
Well, that's a no-no in JavaScript. We like to use camelized method names. Well, there's no automatic way for doing that yet, and the framework makes it a little bit difficult to do. JSON structure is incredibly picky. Uh, you have to have the ID, which is expected, but you have to make sure not to include uh, root in JSON if you have enabled that in Rails. That will cause lots of silent uh, failures. And then finally, we can't reuse those templates. Um, as you saw, we had to strip all of the Ruby code out to use those. This is where something like handlebars is more useful because it's language agnostic. And because we had to use a DOM node for every structure element, like a show if or a for each, we get these div elements all over the place, which means you'll find yourself uh, breaking a lot of HTML5 rules, which doesn't settle well with me. And then finally, there's some gotchas with real time. If you're doing the multi-process method, um, there's some slowdown in there. But uh, overall, I've been really excited to work with Batman JS. I've been working on a personal project. I encourage you guys to go try it out on your own app. Make something awesome. And then while you're at it, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Nibbler. Thanks, guys. Once you get to a, like a lot, a lot of, of bound fields, um, it can start to get a little bit slow. So it's actually like the Angular approach is a little faster, um, which so Batman sort of benefits from that too. Yeah, because I don't think you'll be re-rendering uh, a lot of the DOM. It, they had two years and they spent a lot of time on optimization because they had a lot of things to bind to. So I think um, the reason they've got some more batches in Batman view is because they tried to make it efficient. But I honestly haven't made an app with quite enough bindings to put it to the limits. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys.